for you at the end of it as well and i'm gonna share my screen and we can bow wow maria how are you feeling i'm feeling good thanks for asking all right cool everybody is in the thing that they thought they signed up for right nobody signed up for something else and like where am i good <laughs> my name is aditi paul this is a brief snapshot about me uh, i'm from calcutta india or kolkata india i moved to the us in 2015 uh, 2010 which is almost 13 years ago it's it's insane it's it's insane like my the number of years i've been here is an actual teenager 13 years um then i got my phd at michigan state university that we, that's what we were talking about with shakira she's also in michigan and post that, just like any other academic does, I got a job in New York City and moved here, uh, got tenure in 2022, and then left all of that. Uh, and the reason why I could leave academia and the reason why I fought so, so, so hard uh, to get out of uh, academia uh, and move into industry. And the thing that helped me do that was my green card because my immigration status was tied to my job and the only way I could divorce myself from that immigration status and the job was through a green card. So that's why I'm very passionate about it because we've moved from our home countries here um, not, to, not to compromise, but to have better things and do better in our lives. So why compromise on that goal? So that was my big drive of getting my green card through EB1. We can talk about that too. And then since last year, I have been <clears throat> a researcher at uh, IPASS integration as a uh, software product uh, company called Boomi. And on the side, when I started creating content on LinkedIn, I really, really tried to not talk about immigration. But the only thing that people resonated with was immigration. So since then, I took up the bait and I have started building an ecosystem for international students just like you to create something that I wish I had back in 2010 so that's about me and i'm going to pass it over to maria and she can share something about herself and then we can get started sure thanks aditi i did not prepare a slide to introduce myself which is a really good idea but uh, my name is maria escobar and i've worked in the global mobility industry for about five years now both as an employment immigration paralegal at a law firm and also in my current role as a global mobility specialist within human resources so what I'd like to provide you guys is just some information on, you know, what goes on in human resources when it comes to employment sponsorship and immigration strategy. So I'll do a quick introduction about that and then uh, about the role of the Global Mobility Specialist as it pertains to employment-based immigration. Awesome. All right. So today's agenda, we are going to learn a thing or two about visa types. Then we are going to talk about how you can take steps to fulfill the visa requirements because nobody teaches us that. And as an ex professor and also an immigrant, I know the rules of higher education and I know the rules of immigration. Both of them may or may not match. So it's on you to figure out how you can stay in higher education and still fulfill your visa requirement goals. The third thing is how do you align the job search together with the visa or the immigration goals that you have? How do you network with peers, professors, and industry to satisfy number two? Uh, and number five, that's when Maria will come in and she's going to talk about uh, what, she, what she just mentioned, how HR works, how immigration works, how, you, how that affects your employability in the US. But before all of that, you know, you, I, I have been a professor, so you have sucks for you you signed up for a session with a professor so i i'm not one of those that like just gonna lecture things i love interaction so what i would like for you to do is the first assignment for the day that is go to polev.com slash aditi paul 767 and you're going to see something on your screen and what i would love for you to do is answer that question that you see on the screen if you cannot see that, please let me know. I will fix it. Can everybody see that question on their screen? Yes, I was just asking in the chat session if we can put the link on the chat so we could just click on it. Um, slash as a people 
737. Ooh, ooh, 737. Sorry. All right. So you should be able to see this screen on your end. So take a minute and answer the question that you see on your screen. I don't know why, but you cannot copy the link on the chat. Can you go ev.com slash other people Could you go back to the stages? The stages. Uh, uh, the next slide. Uh, do you want that? Because I didn't want you to see it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tata, Tata, are you uh, logging in from your phone? Yeah, so you you might have to type it in. So it's polev.com slash at the ball seven three seven sorry this should be seven three seven People can enter, yeah. Mayuk, you could. Yes, can enter. It is one question, right? Yeah, that is one question. Okay. Because the answers have not trickled in yet, so I'm thinking. Is say presenter not found? Okay. What is your current top priority? Okay, right now the answers are coming in. Let's see. Freedom, processing H1B application, long term, completing my bachelor's, learn about H1B, working on starting my journey toward immigration, creating a suitable profile for EB1, long term bachelor's, short term internship. Okay, so I can't log on. I'll just put my own answer on the chat. Sure. Would that be fine? That's that's absolutely fine. Finishing up my PhD. Oh, these are great answers. And there's a reason why I asked you to put these answers in. And the reason is, as an international student and as a foreign born, what you will see whether you want to complete your PhD, whether you want to get an internship, with everything that you do starting today or that you've already started, it's going to be affected by your immigration status. And when you think about your immigration status, you have to think in two ways. One is temporary work authorization and then you have permanent work authorization. So when you're saying that, okay, you want to finish your PhD or when you get an internship, well, first you have to make sure that you have a job employment and that job empl in that job employment your paperwork for your opt that is optional practical training gets processed and after that your h1b gets processed and after that you get your permanent work authorization to this thing called eb2 which is employment based second preference after which you get your green card and then you have you become a citizen now the thing is this is the happy path to immigration right you come here as a student you get your OPT. If you're a STEM student, you get two more years that is STEM OPT. 
after that your employer applies for your h1b you get that h1b after that your employer applies for your green card and you get that green card and you become a citizen this is the straight straightest most linear path and this is what we default to thinking about when we come to the us but when you actually live here long enough you understand that this path is never this straight like sunil was talking about and shakira heard that he had to change from l1 to f1 to h1b to o1 all of these permutations and combinations keep happening so what is the not so happy path somebody has already talked about the not so happy path is your h1b not getting picked up the not so happy path is your eb2 that is the second preference of getting your green card you get stuck in a gridlock or your employer does not does not apply for it so what what kind of contingency plan do you have for that? These are some of the roadblocks you may encounter. And I know that I'm starting this entire conversation being the most negative, negativist, nanciest person, but this is not me. These are all the things that my friends, my friends of friends, if you talk to the immigrant community, somebody has experienced all of this or some of this to some extent, and Maria can talk about that. That is, sometimes your employer will refuse to file your H-1B. Sometimes you're going to run out of time on your STEM OPT and your H-1B has not come through. H-1B does not get picked because there are less than 10% chances with the whole fraud that happened. And then you have your second lottery. And even with that, you get rejected. Your H-1B or H-1B renewal can get rejected. Just because you got your H-1B doesn't mean that it's going to get renewed the next time. Do you have a plan for that? Next up is if you change jobs, because we've all come here for career growth. And if you change jobs on your H-1B, that H-1B may not get transferred in the right time and now you've lost both. That is, those are the roadblocks and hurdles on the temporary work authorization side. Similarly, on the permanent work authorization side, even if your employer applies for your H-1B or takes you up on an OPT, they might refuse to apply for your green card. This, the second thing has happened with my brother-in-law, where he was an engineer from IIT. Everybody from India knows IIT. Then he came here for a master's in engineering. He clearly qualified for the second preference of his green card, but his then employer put him in the third category. So what could have been done in seven years took him 14 years to get his green card. And these are things that may not be in your control. Speaking of things not being in your control, retrogressions. Everybody familiar with this term called visa bulletin? People know about visa bulletins here. Might I suggest you make visa bulletins your new best friend? When you look at visa bulletins and when you look at things like priority dates, final action date, make it a priority to learn about what these things mean because they directly impact your future. And we can talk more about that. You will see that According to the new visa bulletin, people who had applied for their green cards through EB2, and I'm talking specifically for Indian nationals, people who are born in India, right? You may, you may have been born in India and you moved to Canada and you have a Canadian citizenship, but you're still going to be assessed based on your place of birth, not your citizenship. And for folks who are born in India, people who had applied for their green cards in 2011 are getting their application processed right now. January 2011, and that's in August 2023. And if you think that, oh, people who got their green card applications in January 2011 are getting processed in August 2023. So according to my calculation, people in February 2011 are going to get their green cards processed in September 2023. It does not work like that. It can get stuck in January 2011 for the longest, longest time. And things like that are showing up not just for folks in India and China, but ROW, that is the rest of the world. So if you're from Bangladesh, if you're from Netherlands, you may get locked into this gridlock, right? This may affect you and, and the signs are moving toward that. Maria, am I right in, in understanding that, that the rest of the world is also getting affected by it? Yes, that's, that's correct. Right? So all of this does not just hamper you getting a green card, but hampers your continuity in your job. If you don't have a, a, a legal status, you're not gonna be able to do your job properly. So it's in your best interest 
to always have a plan B in every part of your immigration journey. What does that mean? For example, H-1B has less than 10% chance of getting approved. Are you proactively building your O-1 profile, right? EB-2, there might be retrogressions. Your employer may not apply for it. Are you working diligently towards securing that priority date, securing that green card application through EB-2 NIW? This is specifically for non-Indians, non-Chinese, right? Are you working toward EB-2 NIW? Are you proactively building your profile toward EB-1? Because all of this safeguards your future. More than getting a green card, this is your legal continuity in the country. So today we are going to talk about that. We're going to talk about these heavily competitive visas. How do you build your profile? And building that profile does not just happen overnight. It happens with smaller steps. But if folks do not know what these, how do you get these visas, right? O-1 visa for temporary work authorization, EB-2 NIW, and EB-1 for permanent work authorization. These are the 10 things that call it the rubric, right? These are the 10 criteria you have to fulfill. Not all 10 of them, three to five of them, but you want to make sure that you're fulfilling them, not just checking them off. This is not just a compliance issue. This is an achievement-based category, and we're going to talk more about that today. Now, I do want to step back and talk about the importance of small steps. Right now, till date, I think I've talked with close to 253 folks, and most, if not all of them, are folks who have been in this country since 2007, 2010. They have a, a, a legal green card application processed, but they're now realizing that, my gosh, like I have waited for 15 years to get my green card. And I'm only talking about Indian nationals right now. I have, I have God forsaken number of years still to go in front of me. How can I build this EB-1? I have also had international students who did not take their O-1 strategy seriously. Now all of their H-1B applications, all of their H-1B chances have expired. They're on their last, last year of STEM OPT and now they're realizing, oh my gosh, how do I build my O-1? And I've also had folks who are non-Indians, non-Chinese, who've come to me and said that my employer is refusing to apply for my green card. How can I get my EB-2 NIW, right? All of those people are in a position of desperation where they are looking at the person who's on the right side of the screen. That is, they're trying to build their profile in a slapdash, mad dash attempt. But what you are doing over here is understanding how can I take small steps today and how can I keep this barometer intact? That is, whatever career choices you're making, be it as an international student or be it as a professional in your career, what are the career choices that you're making that is moving the needle for EB1, O1, EB2, NIW just by 1%? So always, always ask yourself, how can I leverage this thing that I'm working on to check off that EB1 criteria, to check off that EB2 NIW criteria, to check off that O1 criteria so that when the time comes, I can pull the trigger and I can get those visas. Any questions so far? Um, yeah, so sorry. I've never heard of O1 before. Is it meant for just Indian immigrant or is for everyone? A good thing to do today, Shakirat, is because we only have limited time, so I do not we do not have time to go through things. So if I were you, I would write down these words, right? And then do a little bit more digging on that. And we, we have events lined up till the end of the year where we are going to talk about people with O1 visas, but it's not just for Indians, it's for everybody. All right. So how do you start? A lot of folks, people are like, man, this is like a large big ass list like you know where where do i start right the first thing that you want to start with is identifying top three to five criteria that you think you can check off based on the work that you're already doing do not pick up criteria that is like a long shot for you so it's, for example if you're a phd student if you're a master's student i would not look into high salary I, we are broke college students. How the hell am I going to get a job straight out of college that's going to guarantee that I a, have, a, have a big paycheck coming in? So clearly that's a long shot. But as a student, you do have access to professors who are working on research. So you might as well focus on that, 
right? So you, you'll see three, two colors over here, orange and yellow. And I'm gonna talk about what are the differences in those colors. I've talked with enough industry professionals, I've talked with enough lawyers, and I've talked with enough academics to understand that the top three criteria that every academic facing individual or research facing individual targets are the ones which are marked in orange. That is, they are going to go for significance of original contribution, they're going to go for authorship of scholarly articles, and they're going to go for participation as a judge. Two out of these three criteria are also targeted by professionals. Those are original contribution, participation as a judge, but professionals also target leading or critical role in their organization and high salary. Right? Now that you have think about think about this as a GPS, you are here and the destination are these three categories. Whatever road you choose should lead to this goal. It may not lead tomorrow, it may not lead next year, it may not lead in three years, but that's your goal, right? So fix on those three criteria and then start identifying opportunities to check off that criteria and leverage one criteria to check off the other. This is what we are going to use. So if you wanna take a snapshot of this in your brain, just take it because we are going to center our conversation till the time that I have with you before I pass it on to Maria based on how you need to do this, okay? This is something that I cannot stress enough where folks will come to like Im immigration lawyers or when I consult folks, they'll come to me and they'll be like, Aditi, I went to this conference and I got the best dissertation award. I, I, I have, I'm making $500,000 as an Amazon uh, software engineer. Uh, I have, th I have, I don't know, like I have judged five hackathons clearly right? I, I satisfy the three criteria. What are my chances of getting my EB1? They just take their resume and they start throwing achievements on those 10 criteria that we just talked about and try to assess, do they satisfy it or not? That is not the right way to build your profile. You need to think of your profile as a wheel. And the center of the wheel is this category. And this is not me saying this is an excerpt word for word from an immigration lawyer's blog. His name is Brian Lissenby, and I'll put it in the chat. I'll send it over to you. Read what he has written. He says, personally, I have never seen an EB1 and you can remove EB1. You can even put O1 over here. You can remove EB1. You can put EB2 and IW over here, right? He says that he has never seen an EB1A application that did not include an argument that the person, in this case, you, did not demonstrate that they made something original which was significant. So every decision that you take from now on out, you have to remind yourself, well, what am I doing in my career? What am I doing as a student? What am I doing as a professional that has my name on it and it's creating impact in the field? This is the number one criteria you need to satisfy and every other criteria becomes a representation of this. Right. So now that you know where to start, now that you know what is the most important thing, what's that first step you take? As a student, right, it does not start with rising to the top of your field. This is not your starting point. This is your starting point. Right. So as a student, what you need to do is Think of your short-term goal and leverage it to satisfy your long-term goal. Your short-term goal, like you already said, is getting an internship, getting a job in your field, and then using that to make original contribution in that field. So thinking about that, how do you know which courses to take, which courses are going to qualify you for an O1, which courses are gonna qualify you for an H1B? I have been a professor, so I know that professors and I'm gonna talk about this in the next slide, professors are going to sell you courses that they think you need to take. Professors are not thinking about immigration. You need to think about immigration. So you need to make a concerted effort in understanding, should I be taking this course or not? How do you make that decision? Use these resources, because these resources are used by professionals 
in the immigration space, in the employment space. So USCIS and immigration professionals use third party resources to determine a minimum requirement for entry into an occupation. So occupation outlook, uh, occupational outlook handbook, ONET online, career one stop, foreign labor certification data center. These are all resources that you need to bookmark today. So giving you an example, what does that look like? So if you go to own it, right, you can you can copy this and I'm going to send send all of these resources to you. Don't worry about that. So go to onetonline.org. Let's say that you are working toward your degree of being a data scientist. So you under occupational keyword search, put in data scientist and you will see some of the technology skills that you need to have. You take those technology skills and then you look at the syllabus, look at the course offerings in your university and see which is coming close to that, right? And take those courses. If you do not know what is gonna be taught in this course, ask your professors to share their syllabus, right? As a professor, I had to do this all the time. And please be aware that professors, just like anybody else are working with their own agenda. It's not always a bad agenda, but it's an agenda nonetheless. I did this as a professor where in order for me to teach a class, I had to get a minimum number of students in that class. So I would pitch that class to my students, regardless of if they needed it or not, right? So it's in your best interest before a big professor is telling you, Shakirat, you need to take this course or Mayuk, you need to take this course. Well, you have to figure out again, does this move the needle for my H1B? Does this move the needle for my O1? Does this move the needle for my EB2 and IW? If it doesn't, don't take it. Do not get coerced into taking courses. Align job search with immigration goals, right? Now that you have a list of technology skills that this particular visa category needs, highlight them. So that when your resume or when your profile comes to somebody like Maria Escobar or another immigration paralegal, it becomes abundantly clear to them that this person has clearly fit for this job. They qualify for this job. Do not live, leave anything to chance. Make it absolutely clear for the person who's making that decision. Maria, did you want to add something to this? Um, yeah, I just wanted to quickly add, so for the ONET online, um, when it comes to the H-1B visa, you can actually filter jobs by specialty occupation, and you can find a list of jobs that would qualify you for the H-1B visa based on the level of um, the level of education required and the specific the specifics of the occupation. So it's it can be a really helpful tool. So going to ONET and filtering through specialty occupations? Yeah, so when you go to the ONET online, you can actually filter by the level of the occupation, by the skill level. So you can actually just filter by skill level four. And I can, if anyone has any questions on this afterward, I'm happy to review it. But um, yeah, you can you can filter by specialty occupations. And those are the occupations that you want to focus on if you are looking to get an H-1B visa. Yep. Cool. I will send out these worksheets to you, right? Um, I'm a big fan of worksheets. So I, over here, if, if, if we are going to throw a lot of things at you, but I want we all want you to remember this. I'm going to send this worksheet. Use this as your playbook, right? So go to ONET under occupational keyword search. Look at the technology skills. Go to your university offerings and ask professors and select courses knowing what you really need to graduate and get a job, right? Number two, uh, number four, network with professors right? Professors are your secret weapon to success. Um, I know higher education, I know Kiki is in the mix, so she'll talk about like, you know, she, she, she'll have a thing or two to say about uh, professors. As, as like, you know, there, there, there can be toxicity in, in work relationships, but understand that you need professors buy-in to build these uh, profiles. So especially as an incoming student, what I would encourage you to do is not just send out emails that are super generic and say that, Professor so-and-so, I would really like to work with you, right? That's not the right way to go. The right way to go is asking professors concerted direct questions, right? Taking a genuine interest in them. I used to do my 
uh, research and online dating. So most of my examples come from there, fortunately or unfortunately, depends on the way you see it. Um, think of like writing uh, uh, emails to your professors as the first date, right? Take genuine interest in them. Show them that you have read their online dating profile. So go to their program webpage, look up faculty profiles, check out their Google Scholar, read one to two of their papers. Now you have ChatGPT. If the language is convoluted, slam that shit in ChatGPT, ask it to summarize it for you and write a targeted email. What does a targeted email look like? This is what a targeted email looked like when you have to work with professors. And this is again, going back to that slide that we just talked about. That is, if you are a student who is looking to build a strong O1 profile, the easiest way for you to do is get on some original contribution through research papers. And for that, you need professors. So instead of asking professors, can I just work with you? Demonstrate that you have done the work research on them and that you are motivated. Professors are spread thin. They are not making enough money for the work that they are doing. The last thing they want is to babysit someone. You don't want to be that child. You want to be a grown adult who comes across as a colleague and a collaborator rather than a student that needs to be nurtured. Demonstrate that. Again, putting in the worksheet, we'll send it to you not just your professors your peers are it's so underrated but your peers are going to make or break the way you collaborate and the footprint that you have in your field i did this to the hilt right for you to understand who are your peers and how you can leverage those relationships might i suggest looking beyond your university especially if you're going to a tier two tier three university in a small college or in a small university town. Do not restrict yourself to those universities. Just because you're from Grand Valley State University doesn't mean you only have to work with Grand Valley State University students. There are folks outside, right? The, the entire internet is there for you. There are associations where you can find these peers. So proactively build that network with these folks. So where do you find these collaborators? You can find them in your own program. They can be your juniors, they can be your seniors, they can be your cohort folks. You can ask them to refer you to somebody else. For example, if you're working with a senior on a research project who's very close to graduating, who needs to dole out one or two more of those publications, if you build a good rapport, if you build a good productive relationship with them, they're more likely to introduce you to some, somebody else who they work with. But if you leave a bitter taste in their mouth and do not pull your weight, then they are less likely to do that. So build these productive relationships with them. Ask them to refer you to their friends. Find specific associations in your field. So for example, if you're a sociology student, there's something called American Sociological Association. I would go there and make an account. I would see what kind of conferences are going on. I, I would see what kind of groups are there. I would reach out to folks who are in those groups. Do the same thing for conferences. And of course, you have LinkedIn, you have social media. Make sure that you are reaching beyond your school affiliation. You're also reaching beyond your discipline. Because you can only make so much of a dent to show that you have contributed in a capacity that is impactful if you're only working in one field. You have to show cross-disciplinary impact. I'll give you an example of somebody who was uh, who got his green card right out of grad school. He got a PhD and he got a green card. I mean, if you want to feel bad about yourself, I did. So please join me in feeling absolutely sucky about yourself. Like, what the hell did I do with my life? So this person, he played his cards right, right? His name is Karan Sandhu. If you're a part of the Slack community that I have, if, you, if you're not, I'll, I'll send, you, send, send the link to you. I would hop on a call with him because he did his PhD in planned breeding. And he did all of the things that I'm showing you on the screen. He got so nerdy about his field, right? Like he came here as a bright eyed international student. He wanted to know everything about everything in plant breeding. So he went to these associations. He volunteered his time to uh, create workshops, to create panel in these conferences. And he created those relationships. 
And lo and behold, in one of these conferences that you went to, somebody was working with computer science or like some, some sort of an AI-esque technology. So he combined his research with AI and he created a new field and a new interdisciplinary um, project that was applicable not just in computer science, but also in biology. So think of those intersections that you can work with so that you are building breadth and you're building depth. You're not just building depth. We'll send you this. Please use this to network with peers, to present your conferences, to promote yourself to the guilds. Last thing before I turn it over to Maria, network with industry contacts. I'll say something that is not politically correct, but I'll say it anyway. Beggars cannot be choosers, right? As international students who are working with a lot of restrictions on your legal status, you cannot be a Puritan and say, mm, I am not going to work in the industry or I'm not going to work in academia. I'm just going to select one or two. No, my friend, you are firing across all cylinders. Even if you do not have any smidgen of interest in going to industry, build those contacts. Dig your well for a rainy day is all I'm going to say, right? Even if, even if you don't need industry contacts, what if you do not get a job in academia and you need to take up an internship in Facebook? Something can happen. So you want to preemptively and proactively build those contacts. And if you need it, now you have it, right? Now there is a there is a method to the madness of networking with industry contacts as well i'll tell you what to do i'll also tell you what not to do right it's a three-step process make it very 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 easy on you right just follow these three steps you're going to be gold identify 10 to 20 experts of varying experience level what does this mean 10 to 20 experts could be if you are a first year phd student let's say i'm an incoming phd student in communication studies at arizona state university first year I would find experts who are 10% ahead of me. So I've talked about Kiki. Kiki is in her final year. I would reach out to her. She's on experience level one. I would reach out to assistant professors. They're in experience level two. I would reach out to associate or deans. That's experience level three. Reach out to folks in varying experience level and learn from them. And don't just learn from them. Do not just encroach on their time. Have something of value to provide to them. What are some things that you can provide to them, especially if you're talking in academia? Volunteer to do a little bit of literature review for them. Do something for them so that their appetite, their trust toward you grows. But do not do it in a way that encroaches on your time and does not give you a kickback. Please ask for credit. Because academia, a lot of folks, as well as industry, can be predatorial in a way where you will do the work, but your name is not going to be shown. You need that name. So please be very explicit in the way you ask and deserve credit. So what to do, what not to do. On the right, left hand side, you see an example of what you need to do. I'm going to pause over here and I'm going to ask you, why, why do you think the first one is something that you need to do and the left one is something that you shouldn't be doing? How are they different? You can unmute yourself and you can share your thoughts. So, um, for the one that is wrong, you are actually not, um, you, you're already saying what you really wanted the connection for. You're just saying, I want to do my profession that I want. You are not in the way saying that you admire what the person has been doing for a yeah, for a long for a longest time, how you admire them, how you want to also, you know, you want to so get, I them. can I don't know if it's me, but I, I'm hearing a lot of echo. So uh, Okay, so can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, so I'm saying that the one that is wrong that we shouldn't do. Is she just going straight to the point, just saying, I want you to be part of my contact, instead of you to appreciate what the person has been doing mm -hmm. in his or her field, to say you admire, you know, 
you've been a silent observer of what he or she has been up to, you are like what he's doing. That way it gives that person a sense of, you know, you really know me or you've really been following me and that they would like to connect rather than just saying, I'm just growing my professional time. I mean, if I see such a thing, I will not, even that I'm not, I'm still a student, I probably will not also accept. Like, so you just want to use me to go your, you know, that's the way I feel. Yeah. yeah. Mayuk, I, I know you also unmuted yourself. Right. Um, the main difference I see between the two is that uh, the one to the left, uh, you are really expressing interest in the person's work. Mm -hmm. Whereas the second one, you're not really expressing interest for the person's work, or but you're just showing off by saying that uh, you are a co-founder of something and you can contribute to it. Uh, so you're not really uh, linking up uh, how both of the works can merge together and how you can, can uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is there's, there's a lot of focus on the left one, on the right one, on yourself, uh, with no focus on the other person. Um, and and what else is jumping up? Yes. I think the difference between those two, uh, first one is bringing you well, bringing the other person value, the second one is not. Right. Yeah, bring the other person value. The, the, the one on the left is specific, right? It's saying, it's, it's telling you things that are very specific. It's not general. What, what, I'm sorry, pardon my French, but what the fuck is a synergy, right? Like, what is that, right? Like, good synergy, what, what, I'm sorry, what? Right, it, it doesn't say anything, right? But over here on the right, on the left-hand side, you can see that the person whose value uh, has been demonstrated, like how have I how have I learned from you? Right, something that Suleen Sunil said when we were talking before this class is like, okay, Aditi, I appreciate like you know, and again, this is not this is not me just like turning the table to like speak good things about me, but he did something which I really want to appreciate. He was very specific in the way he said, I really appreciate the work that you've done. Right, after joining this community, my awareness has grown. Right, like you're be very specific over here this person says that okay i loved the content that you shared in your newsletter this is the impact that it has created on me i grew from 3000 to 16000 and guess what now that this person has reached out to angela angela now gets interested in this person like oh my gosh tell me more and that can lead to a collaboration to to somewhere you don't even know right so be specific like you said um Focus on the other person. That's so, so important. And tell them why. Give them a reason why you're connecting with them. The, anything that could be worse than this is just hitting the connect button. At least this person wrote something, right? Don't just willy-nilly send something to someone. And the, and the other thing is asking for a recommendation on this other person doesn't even know you, right? Ask yourself, like, would you want to be approached like this? If you don't want to be approached like that, don't approach other, other people like that. But again, comes back to building those industry contacts. So to review what we have covered so far before I pass it off to Maria is understanding why you are working toward O1, why you are working toward EB2 and IW, why you are working toward EB1. It's not to just secure a green card. It's not to just secure a visa. That impacts your ability to work in the US. Right. And when you're building these profiles, don't just start from anywhere. Focus on original contribution and impact. That's the second thing. And the last thing is, if you have to make original contribution and impact in your field, you cannot start with a big step. Start really, 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 really small. Piecemeal it. But as you're piecemealing it, always ask yourself, what am I doing today? How does this decision that I made today going to move the needle for that O1 profile, for that EB2 and IW profile, and for that EB1 profile. With that, I'll pass it off to Maria. Thanks, Aditi. And I just want to say, as someone who is working in HR, and one of my main jobs is to assess candidates for visa feasibility, um, if you do follow those steps when it comes to the EB1 or the O1, it just places you, it gives you such a higher opportunity of being sponsored by an employer. 
um, because it takes a lot of the burden of, of that from the employer. So I would definitely recommend that you follow those, those tips. But um, just a, a quick reintroduction for myself. Um, I, am, I work in global mobility and I've been in the industry for about five years. I worked at a law firm as an employment, employment immigration paralegal. And now I work in HR, um, helping to, to support businesses in, uh, in immigration compliance. So um, as far as a few of the tasks that, um, well, I mean, we all know that the US immigration system is very new nuanced and complex. And this is one of the key areas where a global mobility specialist supports an organization and how they can support you as a foreign national candidate or employee. So I've listed some of the common tasks that we handle related to immigration so you can get a better understanding of how that works. Um, and then, so one of my main tasks, like I said, is assessing the immigration eligibility of foreign nationals. So that involves evaluating the immigration options available to potential hires, considering their qualifications and experience, and also the organization's needs. So when you're applying for a job, you have to answer the question, will you now or in the future require sponsorship? Um, recruiters typically are not immigration professionals. So when you answer yes to that question, your recruiter will reach out to the global mobility team to complete an immigration feasibility assessment. So we will review your, your immigration needs and the material facts related to the position, typically with our immigration counsel, um, and then advise the recruiter on whether or not it's feasible to move forward with visa sponsorship for you as a candidate. And if there's any risks involved for the businesses, like the risk of denial or the risk of a request for evidence. Um, some organizations are more risk averse than others, but that just it's going to vary depending on, on the position and, and, the, and the company as well. Um, I know that one of the questions that was submitted was asking about what are the common reasons for H-1B denials or RFEs. And I'll be honest, in the in the five years that I've worked in this industry, I have never actually had an H-1B be denied. But this is just the result of companies doing their due diligence and following guidance of their attorneys and visa specialists. Oh, sorry, looks like there's a question. Are you legally obliged to answer yes for the sponsorship question? So I'm going to address that, um, you know, later on in the presentation. But I would always, if you do require sponsorship, I would always say that you should answer yes, because um, you don't want to start working for an employer and then eventually, you know, two or three years down the line, have to spring that question on them on whether or not they're willing to sponsor you. Um, just for the, for the sake of transparency, number one, and number two, because they may not be willing to, and it's just going to be the best situation for you to work with an employer from day one that understands your needs and is willing to sponsor you. So I would say that, yes, I, I would always be transparent as far as your, your immigration status, but uh, just a, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, Maria, I, I know that this question is on everybody's mind uh, and there's so much heated debate on social media as well. So since you're on the topic, I know I didn't want to stop you from 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 completing what you wanted to say, but a lot of folks think that the anyways, international students are struggling to get jobs. And then when you say yes, it the ATS filters you out. Um, so that's why they'll say, oh, I'm just going to say no. Uh, because technically, technically, I'm in my STEM OPT, so I don't need sponsorship. Uh, so by the time I will need sponsorship, I would have built enough trust with the uh, employer and they would be more likely to apply for my H-1B. So if that's the strategy that they're taking, what are the pros and cons of that? This is going to depend on the employer because some companies are more risk averse and some companies are not as pro-immigration as others are. This is not really as much of an issue now as it used to be. Um, I mean, my position exists because of the fact that companies need and want to retain foreign talent. And every all of the major players in every industry have global mobility specialists specifically for this reason. And selecting yes to that sponsorship question does not put you in a separate category. It just lets the recruiter know that someone will have to at some point assess you know, your immigration feasibility. And if the response is that we aren't able to sponsor a candidate, that's going to be across the board really for, for any organization because there will be, a, there's some kind of limitation. I'm not sure if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm going to talk about that definitely in the, the next slide as well. But yeah, one of the, one of the big responsibilities for me is assessing a candidate and then, um, you know, basically, yeah, advising the business on whether or not it's feasible to to hire that candidate based on their sponsorship status. And so it's not necessarily saying yes or no because of they because they need sponsorship. It's saying yes or no based on whether or not it's feasible for the organization to sponsor that candidate. And that just depends on what the organization's immigration strategy is. 
And so just to keep going a little bit, so for as far as the, the questions that were submitted, and I was talking about H-1B RFEs, two of the very common scenarios that come up when we assess candidates for, for H-1B status as are related to the specialty occupation. So as some of you might know, the H-1B visa can only be requested for, for positions that require a bachelor's degree or its equivalent in a specific field of study. So marketing and sales positions, business analyst positions, and certain administrative roles may require a bachelor's degree, but the degree can be you know, in, in a variety of fields. And in that scenario, USCIS may request additional evidence to show that the position requires specialized knowledge or that the beneficiary has the necessary qualifications and experience. And similar to that scenario, if an applicant's academic qualifications are not quite aligned with the H-1B specialty occupation, the USCIS may also request additional evidence to show that the beneficiary is qualified. So for example, if you have a degree in industrial engineering, but the position that you applied for is an H-1B specialty occupation uh, for computer system analysts, that discrepancy in the, in the, the the bachelor's degree and the position job title, um, that can trigger a request for evidence. So it's up to the global mobility team to assess that situation with our immigration counsel and advise the business on the risk involved in these situations. So typically we can say, you know, there's a risk that there will be an RFE issued for this petition due to, you know, whatever reason, but we can anticipate being able to respond and get an approval and the recruiter will then move forward with that candidate. Uh, but there are situations where the risk outweigh the benefits and um, we aren't able to move forward with that candidate. But that's just, it's going to depend on a lot of different things. So what you got your bachelor's degree in or your master's degree in, what your professional experience has been and how that relates to the position. So that's going to be, it's very nuanced. So um, another main responsibility is to guide the business on visa strategy. So helping the organization make the informed decisions about the appropriate visa candidate for candidates or, or for their employees. So visa strategy questions are encompass questions like, you know, what is our process for selecting employees to submit to the H-1B cap? Um, will green card sponsorship be contingent on anything like tenure or the nature of the position? Um, when, at, at which point of, the, of employment are we going to start the green card sponsorship for our employees? And is that timeline competitive within the industry? And are we gonna support their dependent applicants? These are the type of questions that businesses make based on the recommendation and guidance of their global mobility team. And the answers to most of these questions are, are definitely relevant to candidates that need sponsorship. Um, and I do wanna stress that most of the companies that are considered leaders in, in whatever industry, and many of the much smaller companies as well, these companies have an immigration strategy already in place. They typically already have answers to all of these questions because it's part of their immigration strategy and it's part of the benefits that they offer in order to be able to attract and retain the top talent regardless of their nationality. So when it comes to sponsorship questions, don't be afraid to ask her what you need and to explore how a potential employer can support you. Um, and like I said, I'll talk about this in a little bit more neat detail um, in the next slide, but to wrap up this section, um, the global mobility team also helps to ensure compliance with visa regulations. So that can mean a, a lot of different things, but just to name a few, um, it can be you know, verifying that employees and the business are maintaining compliance with the terms of their visa. So for an, ex for an example related to an H-1B visa, the H-1B is location specific, so it's tied to a specific work site. And with the rise of hybrid and remote work, sometimes employees move and they don't realize that they're violating the terms of their, be their visa just by moving, maybe like 30 miles away. So another example related to um, the PERM green card process is for, for promotions. So the PERM application is also tied to a specific occupation and work site. So depending where you are in the PERM process, a change to either one of these criteria could really mean having to restart the entire process. And with the PERM time Timelines getting increasingly longer, having to restart the process can be really detrimental. So those are the few of the ways that a global mobility specialist can guide a business and how they can support you as, as immigrant employees. Uh, but moving on to the next slide, um, as far as uh, practical advice, um, coming from someone who works in HR and knows how the immigration process works, I definitely want to stress a couple of things. Um, the first one is being transparent. So when it comes to your immigration status and the prospect of green card sponsorship, honesty is always gonna be your best policy. 
And when recruiters ask about your immigration history and your sponsorship needs, it's really essential to communicate your needs clearly and accurately, because it's going to set the expectations, like the right expectations for your immigration. And it also demonstrates just your professionalism and integrity. Um, you really don't want to be two years into employment and then say, like, now I need sponsorship because your employer may not be willing to go that route. Um, another thing is um, a common question that comes up is timing. So when and how to discuss the topic of green card sponsorship with an employer. Um, there's not a, a one size fits all answer to this question, but having conversations about this sooner rather than later can really work in your favor. Um, I know a lot of individuals are finding themselves on specific visas like on F1 OPTs or you know, H1B with limited periods of authorized stay. And in these scenarios, asking about green card sponsorship um, during the recruitment phase is, is not just beneficial, but it's, it's gonna be essential. So if you're already working for a company and wondering when you should ask about the potential of, of green card sponsorship, the answer is now, like as soon as, as, soon as you possibly can is to start asking that question. Um, another common question is, uh, how can I effectively persuade my employer to sponsor my green card? And I would encourage you to approach that topic again with confidence and to recognize that your skills and experiences, like this is highly sought after in the US job market. And it's understandable that discussing immigration matters can bring up some anxiety. I know it can be really daunting, but the timing of conversations about green card sponsorship isn't just about strategy. It's also about aligning your career with your immigration goals. And ultimately, the, the cost of sponsoring a green card is significantly less than the cost of recruiting, onboarding, and, and training a new hire. And that doesn't take into consideration the, the knowledge loss when employees leave and they go work for the competition who is willing to sponsor them. So again, just approach the topic with confidence. But in addition to that, if your employer hasn't had a discussion with you about sponsorship, it may be likely that they aren't familiar with the process, which is why my next point is important. Um, staying informed. So stay informed on stay informed on immigration processes, advocate for yourself and, and definitely express your desire to contribute in the long term. If your if your immigration status has limitations, communicate that clearly and just say, I'm authorized to work until this date without green card sponsorship. Um, leverage, leverage your resources, seek outside immigration counsel, get a second opinion, talk to your peers in similar situations. Um, just basically understand your immigration status thoroughly and communicate openly with your manager and your HR team about your needs. Um, and then lastly, uh, if you do need to decline a job offer or leave an employer due to just inadequate immigration support, it's really important to provide constructive feedback to the business. Um, and this is because companies that are aiming to succeed now in the age of the global workforce, they recognize the value of diverse talent and they have to offer competitive benefits to ensure their own success. So if a company is missing out on you know, exceptional candidates because they hesitate to support green card sponsorship, it's important for them to receive this feedback because they need to realize the importance of adapting their immigration strategy. And I see these conversations happen all of the time in global mobility spheres and in HR groups. Um, taking polls, people asking, you know, when do you start your green card sponsorship? Or we start green card, green card sponsorship on day 90. When does your company start sponsorship and why? Um, like this is, this is some, these are, the kind of, these are the kinds of conversations related to sponsorship that are happening now. Um, and I know it's very different from when it was even five or, or 10 years ago. Um, a company that genuinely wants to integrate your talent into their organization um, should be more than willing to provide the necessary immigration support. Um, and I know that I would basically like to conclude by saying that, you know, your immigration journey, especially as an immigrant job seeker, it's not just about securing a job. It's it's about finding an employment or finding an environment that values and supports your contributions. Um, and we have a few questions that I would I would like to address if we have the time, um, but they're pretty complex and, and subjective. So um, Aditi, I don't know if you if we do have the time to answer any questions. But that, that brings us to the end of our master class today. I want to reiterate uh, the free resources. I will be sending out the slide. I would be sending out the handouts. I will send out links to all the websites. I will send out a list of immigration lawyers to follow and also a link to the Slack channel for students and young professionals who are navigating this market. But to cap it off, I do want to reiterate what uh, like Maria uh, and, and, and we chatted about so far that this is a long 
long process, right? You just took one tiny step toward that, a very significant one, but a tiny one nonetheless. But this, I'm just so glad that you're here because it demonstrates what, what Maria was saying, that we have to be proactive in these matters. So, but you've already demonstrated today. So what we're gonna do is, I know it's 1.07 and we were supposed to end at one. Uh, we'll, we'll take another 15 minutes to answer those questions. Uh, but if you have any residual questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Feel free to reach out to Maria uh, and I, uh, if you're connected on LinkedIn, if not, happy to connect. But that, we are going to open it up to questions. Please raise your hands. If you have a question, we are gonna go down through that list one by one. All right, let's go with AJ and then Sunil and then Shakirat. Uh, hey, Aditi and uh, Maria, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. I feel like I learned a lot and you know, I'm not, I'm not really afraid of starting my, my H1B process. So my question will, is going to be for uh, Maria. So how so as a global as a global mobility specialist, how do how do uh, how do you guys assess sort of like candidates feasibility since you um, like do you go based uh, based on the candidate's resume or like the history? So like what uh, what kind of um, what kind of factors play in? So it really depends on the the specific candidates needs. So I'm just going to go on a very basic example. So let's say this is a candidate that is about to graduate with, you know, their degree in whatever their degree in is, is in and they're applying for a specific job. So if they're an F1 candidate, let's say it's they're el eligible to have their STEM OPT EAD for three years. Um, so what we would do as, uh, as, in, as a global mobility specialist, the way that we would assess this candidate is our immigration council will, will, will really see if um, because ultimately, the goal at the company that I work for is to get green card sponsorship for everyone, every applicant that needs green card sponsorship, which is very generous, and I, I love working there. Um, but the way that we would assess that is, um, as you guys know, there is an H-1B cap every year, and we can go ahead and start the PERM green card process if you're on F-1 status, and a lot of companies are very willing to do so. At CDEN, we start the process at 90 days for every single applicant. Um, so the way that we would assess that candidate is essentially saying, okay, they're eligible to work for the next three years without sponsor without sponsorship, technically. Uh, within those three years, we can get approval for a PERM. So we don't really have to say, that it's going to be limited because when those three years are up, the perm is already going to have been approved and maybe we'll be able to apply for an, ad an adjustment of status depending on where the where the depending on where the employee is from. So I I'm, I feel like I'm doing a bad job of answering this question because it's just going to be very subjective. Um, as far as the H-1B visa goes, which is one of the, the most common categories, uh, we're really checking to see if the if the candidates employment history and if their um, if their education qualifications align with the position. And we're also checking for prevailing wage requirements. So some of you guys might know this, but half of the H-1B process is basically the, the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor, um, it, it dictates the, the amount that you have to pay, that you have to pay an immigrant employee. And that's going to be dependent on, you know, the employees or the possible employees qualifications. Their, their employment history, the level of, of skill that they have, and also on the location where they're working. So let's say that you are, we have two candidates that are the same the same on everything as far as qualification. One lives in a small city in Texas and another one lives in the Bay Area. The prevailing wage for the Bay Area is gonna be significantly higher than a small city in Texas. And so that might make the person living in the Bay Area not necessarily a, a candidate that we would be less likely to hire, but it will make the prevailing wage salary higher, which means that, for example, for you living in the Bay Area, we may have to pay you at least $150,000 for that job. And a person living in a smaller city, we might have to pay them only $125,000 for that job. And those are all things that are, are taken into consideration when it comes to candidate um, feasibility. But I'm sorry, that was a very, like, it's hard to give a, a an objective question to that or an objective response to that because it's so like it is subjective so I'm ho I hope that helped it did it did thank you thank you so much great um Sunil uh, had a question and then Shakira yeah thank you so uh, my question is regarding the h1b uh specialty occupation uh if suppose like uh, my designation is technical consultant but my role is more towards the software tester or a QA 
so my my job descriptions i am mentioning as uh, for the software tester but uh, but my designation uh, which i have in my job offer is technical consultant so do you think that could be a reason of rfp or maybe that could be an issue the job description is like how how important it is so i would definitely encourage you to review that with with your your employer's immigration counsel because they'll be able to better assess that situation but i would say those RFEs are not always, not, not every RFE is substantive. I mean, we've gotten, I've seen specialty occupation RFEs for, for pediatricians, which are clearly, you know, that's clearly a specialized occupation because it requires a bachelor's degree or higher. And so when it comes to, like, I've seen many, many applicants where there's like a slight chance that there'll be an RFE based on a discrepancy between their experience and the position. But most of the times we're able to overcome those just based on, you know, the the way that we the way that we craft our immigration strategy. So I wouldn't be, it's not, it's not that it's necessarily a, like a, a huge hurdle to overcome when it comes to like your your specific um, degree and then the job title and the position, as long as you're able to prove that, you know, the courses that you've taken, which is really important, like Aditi mentioned, the courses that you've taken align with, with your personal experience and then also with the requirements of the position, the title or the, the degree discrepancy is not going to be, it's not going to be a huge detriment. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we also had a, before we take Shakira's question, there was a question about, um, when to approach the legal counsel in your company for O1 or EB1? Uh, because these are these are like special requests, right? Like when your H1B does not get picked up, then you go for O1. When you have a backlog in your EB2, then you go for EB1. So when's the how do you how do you make sure that you're placing it right time wise? So like, like I said, I would start that conversation on day one, um, preferably before even day one. I mean, I have seen the company that I work for. I mean, we sponsor in any, in any way we can, we sponsor. So if someone is on F1 status and they're eligible for an O1 or EB1, we're starting that process within the 90 days. Um, and the more prepared that you are with all of your um, the documentation that you need and the evidence, um, the better, of course. So like I would say start that as soon as possible. Shakira? Okay, so for me, um, you see, going back to the H-1B visa, because I know that when we apply for jobs, they always, they always have that question. And I've seen that when you pick yes, that you need sponsorship. So take for instance, I'm just in my second year of master's in cybersecurity, and I know that I will be entitled to three-year OPT. For now, I'm looking for to do job, right? To look for employment. Immediately when you put in yes for some organization, once you say in the nearest future with you, once you just say yes, it comes to say we're sorry, we are not, and they cannot proceed your application. So what will you say? Because you don't even know those organizations that will then feel other way when you say yes, then they will not say we can't proceed. So how do you then go about this is really something that is giving me a lot of, you know, concern. Right. Understandable. And like Aditi said earlier, and I, I also don't think it's politically correct and it does come to beggars can't be choosers um, because it, it's hard as, as an immigrant, especially when, you know, your time is limited to, to find an employer that is willing to, to sponsor. But the reality is that now the, like the the major players in every company are they are they are aware that there are sponsorship needs and they are aware that they need to have a strategy to navigate that. So for you that you have three years of F one OPT after you graduate, um, that gives your employer you know let's say you find a job immediately after after you finish and you did let them know that you'll require sponsorship. That leaves your employer three opportunities to apply for the H or to submit you for the H one B cap, and. In the meantime, if it's possible and if they're willing to do so, they can still start the perm process for the EB2 um, without you having an H1B. And so you may not ever have to be, uh, you, you may never have to be on H1B status if that's the case. Um, but I do know, I, I know that there are employers who outright will not sponsor. And those are not employers that you want to work for. <laughs> and ultimately, if you if you know that an employer is gonna, is gonna reject you and you know you need a job regardless, then you don't have to say that you need sponsorship in the future if you don't intend to ever request sponsorship from that employer. 
So what are some green flags or red flags when, when we see an employer, like, you know, when you say that some employers are immigration averse versus some are pro-immigration, are there some like telltale signs uh, of understanding if they are pro or anti? Yes, um, I would say, so when you're applying for a job, if you select yes to needing green card sponsorship and the recruiter is gonna request additional information on your background, you can ask them if there's someone within the company that's that's willing to have a discussion with you about the, the process of sponsorship. Um, I've had conversations with several candidates where we discuss the, the, the strategy for them because on day one, we create that strategy and we don't hire candidates where there's not an immigration strategy in place. And I know like, you know, Meta, like Amazon, Netflix, Uber, LinkedIn, McDonald's, all of these companies have global mobility specialists. And it's very likely that there's a dedicated professional that works with visa compliance within a company. So a green flag would be if a recruiter is willing to connect you with someone within the within the organization that can discuss your immigration needs. Um, and oh, sorry, go ahead. Like, and the red flags, plural would be. The, the red flags is, well, I mean, it's kind of hard because there's there's so many and it, it's kind of hard to assess that. But, you know, if you select that you'll need sponsorship and you'll see like and you see like a bunch of follow up questions related to that, that might not be the best. <laughs> that might not be the best, uh, the best chance for you. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, some employers are more risk adverse than others, but you actually can see um, there, there's information online available on on organizations and how many visas they they sponsor. So mm -hmm. it's just it's just going to depend on on the employer and. And if you guys have specific questions on that, if you're looking to apply with a certain company, you can definitely reach out to me and I'll try to figure out what I can as, as it relates to, to their sponsorship strategy. That's great. Where do we look up how many visas they have sponsored? So, and I don't remember the exact website because this was a couple of years ago when the last when I last checked. But the Department of Labor actually has public information on the um, on the H one B visas that are submitted by employers and based on certain occupations as well. And it lists pretty much all of them. So you can see what companies are submitting uh, are submitting H-1B visas. Sounds good. This is great. I mean, we can listen. I mean, we can, we can talk. I, I kept a timer for all of us so that we are, I know we are just on the cusp of 15 minutes, but I want to be respectful of Maria's time and your time too. Um, thank you again, Maria, for being here. And thank you all for being here. If you can take a minute to thank Maria, um, she took out time from her day to um, inform us about like, you know, how, how these things work. And this was on a whim, by the way, everything works on a whim for me. I'm like, Maria, you commented on my LinkedIn meme. Uh, thank you so much. Can we head on a call? And then we got on a call and I asked her, are you willing to do a session for international students? And she did. Um, and thank you for staying back and, and answering all the questions. Any last words of advice for, for our folks who have joined today as they navigate okay. the process? My laptop is at 5%. I really hope it doesn't die. But no, I guess my my biggest thing is just to have confidence in yourself and in your abilities and to and to expect sponsorship because that should be the expectation. And the more people, the more immigrants that are that are not being hired by a company, the more that a company loses talent and loses money based on not being able to hire hire um, you know foreign talent, the more willing that they will need to become to hire that talent. So have high expectations. Always know that you are you're the prize essentially. So mm -hmm. um, that, that's how I would that's that's the best advice I could give. Um, that, that's that's the best. I mean, and, and we we need we we need to hear that as immigrants because we're like, oh my god, like, am I encroaching? No, you're not. You are the prize. You heard that straight from Maria, uh, and that's that's how you should feel. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you all. Uh, I will send out all the information. Just give me some time. I'll eat and then I'll send it over to everybody. I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out what to eat for lunch. <laughs> all right. Thank take care, so all. Thank you.